And hello again from Fox News in Washington. Congress used the power of the purse to deny President Trump all the money he wants to build a wall on the southern border. So the president invoked executive powers to free up billions of dollars to do it anyway. The president says there's a crisis at the border. But critics, including some Republicans, say the president's move has created a crisis of its own. In a moment, we'll speak with White House senior policy advisor Stephen Miller. But first, let's get the latest from Kevin Cork at the White House. Kevin. Chris, the president may have avoided another shutdown fight by signing off on a funding bill, but his use of executive power will very likely create a new battle in the courts. We have tremendous amounts of drugs flowing into our country, much of it coming from the southern border. I'm going to be signing a national emergency. In laying out the reasoning for declaring a national emergency, President Thank Trump you. lit a political fuse, reigniting a separation of powers debate and setting the stage for a possible constitutional crisis. At issue, border wall funding, illegal immigration, and the use of power given to the president by Congress. But criticism has come from both the left and the right, with Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer and Speaker Nancy Pelosi issuing a statement calling the president's declaration unlawful over a crisis that does not exist. Meanwhile, Trump loyalists howled because they believe the president signed off on a funding bill that restricts much of what and where a wall could be built, accusing Mr. Trump of setting off an illegal immigration stimulus. The only national emergency is that our president is an idiot. Chris, if the White House spends the money sequentially as they currently plan to do, they would spend over $5 billion before any emergency funds are tapped. That's money to get moving, if you will, while this battle makes its way through the courts. Chris? Kevin Cork reporting from the White House. Kevin, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. And joining us now for an exclusive interview, White House Senior Policy Advisor Stephen Miller. Stephen, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Great to be here. Thank you. I want to start with something that President Trump said Friday when he was declaring a national emergency. Here he is. I could do the wall over a longer period of time. I didn't need to do this, but I'd rather do it much faster. I didn't need to do this. How does that justify a national emergency? Well, as you know, Chris, we already have 4,000 troops on the border in light of the national emergency, a decision that was made almost a year ago, as we've seen an increasing number of people crossing the border, as well as increasing violence in Mexico. What the president was saying is, is that like past presidents, he could choose to ignore this crisis, choose to ignore this emergency, as others have, but that's not what he's going to do. The president talks about an invasion, use that word multiple times on Friday, an invasion on the southern border. But let's look at the facts. I want to put them up on the screen. 1.6 million people were stopped crossing the border illegally back in 2000. Less than a quarter that many were caught last year. The government's own numbers show, for all the presidents talk about drugs streaming over the border, 80 to 90 percent of the cocaine, heroin, and fentanyl seized at the border is seized at ports of entry, not along unfenced areas. And in 2017, twice as many of the new people in the country illegally were from visa overstays as were from crossing the border. Again, where's the emergency, the national emergency, to build a wall? There's a lot of data you just presented there, so I'd like to go through it each one piece at a time if I could. So let's start with your point about the border crossings in the year 2000. Well, as you know, when George Bush came into office, illegal immigration total doubled from 6 million to 12 million by the time he left office. That represented an astonishing betrayal of the American people. And I'm not going to sit here today and tell you that George Bush defended this country on its southern border because he did not. One of the biggest changes that's happened since then and now is the mass release of illegal aliens due to a patchwork of court rulings and loopholes in our federal laws and changing tactics from smugglers and transnational I, organizations. I, I, I want to go into, into all of this, but I mean, let's just right, focus on that one issue. Right. Four times as many people were coming across right. the border back in 90, 2000 as now. Back then, so why is that a national Back then, 95% could be turned around in a matter of days. As a result of 
loopholes, activist judicial rulings, and increasing sophistication from cartels, the reality is, is that more than half of people crossing the border are what we call non-impactable. They can't be turned around. And so what you see is sophisticated operations and smugglers will actually push out migrants and children and family units to divert border agents, and then because there's not secured areas with the wall, they'll then cross after the border agents have been diverted to those areas. But at a fundamental level, we could go down to the details, and, and you know, Chris, I could go down to the details as much as you want to. But the bottom line is this. Please don't. <laughs> but, the, but the bottom line is this. You cannot conceive of a nation without a strong, secure border. It is fundamental and essential to the idea of sovereignty and national survival to have control over who enters and doesn't enter the country. And we can get into the statistics. You want to talk about drugs? There's been a huge increase in drug deaths since George W. Bush and Barack Obama were in I, office. I understand that, but 80 to 90 percent of those drugs right, that are being like, seized don't come across an unfenced area as they come from right. ports of entry. But, those are your own Customs and Border Patrol numbers. Which is the reason why we also ask for additional resources at the ports of Entry. But Chris, what you got? But Chris, the problem with the statement that you're apprehending 80 or 90 percent of drugs at ports of entry is that's like saying you apprehend most contraband at TSA checkpoints at airports. You apprehend the contraband there because that's where you have the people, that's where you have the screeners. I assure you, if we had people of that same density and screeners of that same density across every single inch and mile of the southern border, you'd have more drugs interdicted in those areas. You don't know what you don't know, and you don't catch what you don't catch. But as a matter of national security, you cannot have uncontrolled, unsecured areas the border where people can pour in undetected. Okay. And I would, uh, one more point. I guarantee you this. If Donald Trump had said he's invoking the National Emergency Military Construction Authority to build a security perimeter in Iraq or Afghanistan or around a military installation in Syria, there would not have been one word of objection from Congress. This is defending our own country. I question whether in fact that's the case, but in any case, let's talk about the constitutional aspects of this, because I've talked to you over the years. I know that you are a constitutional conservative, and you believe the Constitution should be interpreted as written, correct? Yes. Okay. Here's Article 1, Section 9, Clause 7 of the Constitution as written. No money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. Isn't what President Trump wants to do a clear violation of what the founders, of what James Madison talked about as giving Congress the power of the purse? No, because Congress in 1976 passed the National Emergencies Act and gave the president the authority as a result of that to invoke a national emergency in many different circumstances, but among them for the use of military construction funds. And that was the point I was making earlier, is that if the president were to say we're going to use military construction funds to, say, increase the perimeter around a base in Bagram, around a base in Syria, nobody would even say anything about it. But, but, let, 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 we have 4,000 troops on the border right now, and as a result of that mission, they need to secure those areas where they're patrolling. But let's talk about national emergencies. National emergencies have been declared 59 times Correct. since 1976 when the law was passed, the National Emergencies Act. Can you point to a single instance, even one, where the president asked Congress for money, Congress refused to give him that money, and the president then invoked national emergency powers to get the money? Well, first of all, can you find out one case? You think what you're missing, Chris, is that the national emergencies don't all have the same authorities and the same justification. I understand that, but there have been 59. This, this, can you find authority, one case like this that? This authority specifically refers to the use of military construction funds. Other emergencies, for example, were declared wait, 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 wait. to be. I mean, if you, want to talk about military, if you want to talk about military constructions, do you know how many times military construction has been invoked as a national emergency? That one was in. Twice. Right. Twice. Once by George H. W. Bush during the middle of the Gulf War, and the second time by George W. Bush right after 9/11. This name, is hardly comparable to either name, of those. Can you name one foreign threat in the world today, outside this country's borders, that currently kills more Americans than the threats crossing our southern border? You know, the the, the joy of this is I get to ask you questions. You the don't get to ask no, me. The answer is no. But you the, then, then answer my question. Can you name one case where a president has asked Congress for money, Congress has refused, and the president has then invoked national powers to get the money anyway? Well, this current situation... Just yes or no, sir. The current situation pertains specifically to the military construction authority. I'm just asking, has I there been the, a single the, case where question, Congress asked for money for military construction, Congress said no, and he this, then... The meaning of the statute, Chris, is clear on its own terms. If you don't like the statute, or members of Congress don't like the statute... Would you agree the answer is no? There hasn't been a 
change it a long like time this. ago. But the premise of your question is also false because Congress has appropriated money for construction of border barriers consistently. This is part of a national security mission. But it has mission. never done this under a national emergency where Con President. We've declared, but we've declared national emergencies to promote democracy in Belarus, to, to promote democracy in Zimbabwe. But it didn't involve to, taking to, to it, the, money that Congress refused to appropriate. They didn't refuse to appropriate it. They passed a law specifically saying the president could have this authority. It's in the plain statute. That's a decision that Congress made. And if people don't like that, they can address it. But to my, to my point that I made, this would not be even an issue if the president was invoking that statute to support some foreign adventure overseas. You and I both know that presidents for years have engaged in one military adventure after another, not to mention the fact that we do operations to destroy drug fields in foreign lands in Afghanistan or in Colombia, and we can't even deal with the criminal cartels operating on our border. Okay, the, let's, the, let's, the, let's talk about the legal I want to move on. Are destabilizing the Western Hemisphere. I want to move on. I want to move on. Respectfully. Issue. Let's talk about the logistics here. If the president gets access to the entire $8 billion he's seeking, how many miles of barrier will he be able to build and how quickly? Well, if you look at the authorities we have, both in terms of drug corridor funds, in terms of national emergency funds, in terms of treasury funds, as well as appropriated funds, and other reprogramming authorities that may exist, in combination with the existing I'm outlays, just asking a question. you're looking at hundreds of miles collectively. And how soon? Well, you're going to see probably a couple hundred miles in time, um, to, I would say, by the end of the next appropriation cycle all together in terms of what we already have underway, what's underway right now, and then what we're going to complete. So by the end of this year, the end of, hundreds you know, of miles. Next fiscal year, one more after this. Okay, so by September of 2020, right. right in the middle of the presidential campaign. My point is that if you look at what we've already outlaid, we have 120 odd miles that are already under construction or already obligated, plus the additional funds we have and that we're going to outlay, you're going to look at a few hundred miles. Okay, final question. If both the House and the Senate approve a resolution of disapproval, which they're allowed to, is specifically called for in the National Emergencies Act, and if they pass it in the Senate, it would be with bipartisan support because there's Republican control. If they pass a resolution of disapproval, will the president veto that, which would be the first veto of his presidency? Well, obviously, the president is going to protect his national emergency declaration, Chris. And I know that we're out of time, but I again want to make this point. There's no threat. So, yes, he will veto? There, he's going to protect his national emergency declaration guaranteed. But there, the fact that they're even talking about a resolution of disapproval shows you this is a statutory issue and a statutory delegation that Congress made. But again, I want to make this point. This is a deep intellectual problem that is plaguing this city, which is that we've had thousands of Americans die year after year after year because of threats crossing our southern border. We have families and communities that are left unprotected and undefended. We have international narco-terrorist organizations. This is a threat in our country, not overseas, not in Belarus, not in Zimbabwe, not in Afghanistan or Syria or Iraq, but right here. And if the president can't defend this country, then he cannot fulfill his constitutional oath of office. Stephen? Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for coming in. It's always good and always challenging to talk to you. Thanks. Up next, we'll bring in our Sunday.